So I guess a little bit about me. Um, why did I choose optometry? Uh, when I was a little kid, I was six years old, I went to the eye doctor and I needed glasses. And I actually was excited about it, but my parents thought, you know, I mean, they didn't like the idea of me wearing glasses. And I think that probably lowered my self-esteem, you know, getting the glasses. And, and at the time, there weren't as many kids in school with glasses. And uh, what I did like, though, is that my eye doctor was always so encouraging and always so nice and would make jokes with me and, um, you know, made me feel uh, important, if you will, or listen to uh, understood, and I always looked forward to seeing him. And um, that kind of was a, a definitely an interesting experience for me. And then when I turned 17, although I wanted contacts before and I was begging my parents, but they wouldn't let me do it. Um, but when I was 17, uh, I graduated what, you know, in Quebec, what was high school there. And I went to CGEP, which, you know, is a unique system. It's kind of like a college before university, which everyone has to go to. And then for the first time, you know, I went to um, like get contacts myself um, and I felt so free. And of course, as a teenager, it builds your self-esteem. And uh, then one day as you know, life is sometimes like that. You don't know when a big decision or big moment will happen until you look back on things. But I was walking through the, you know, student kind of hall and there were recruiters and there was like shiny, um, you know, pamphlets from Waterloo. And one of those pamphlets had optometry on it. And I really didn't understand the, the differences in healthcare professions, optometry, ophthalmology, and opticianry. And maybe it's a good time for me to explain those things briefly. Um, so when I was a kid, I saw an ophthalmologist who was an eye doctor who was also a surgeon. Uh, he was older, so he wasn't doing surgery and was doing basic eye exams, just like um, you know optometrists um, do as well. So, but when I was 17, I went to see an optometrist because my doctor who, who had seen me when I was a kid didn't really do contacts. And, so forth. So I, I went to him and I was reintroduced to eye care, uh, of course, in an exciting time for me because uh, I wanted those contacts. And um, when I saw that pamphlet from Waterloo, you know, I mean, it's totally put things together for me. And I was like, you know, this is a career which sounds really interesting. And I realized that optometry is a separate school from medicine, like dentistry. So it's a different path. And honestly, at the time, I didn't really feel like I wanted the gore, you know, of, of medicine or, or I wasn't really interested in other medical careers. And uh, of course, later on, I can tell you now that I'm an optometrist, that uh, what's funny is that I love to see, you know, blood in the eyeball or like, you know, something crazy, gooey, gross in the eye, which is funny because I don't like seeing that stuff in other parts of the body. I'm not usually one who watches those, you know, uh, surgery channels. But it's weird because my colleagues who are in other fields of medicine, find the eye the grossest thing where there's like, you know, like a foreign body lodged in the eye, or I, I saw a patient with a fish hook lodged in their eye. And I thought that was really cool. But um, some of my colleagues who do, you know, way more invasive stuff generally find that to be totally gross. So I think it's probably conditioning as well. And all to say that, you know, you can get used to anything. Um, it's just a matter of perspective. So in terms of my, my path to optometry after that, I went to Waterloo. I was from Quebec, so you know it was kind of difficult because you had to pay full fees at the time, which back in my day was nothing compared to what it is today, but it was still a great, you know, a significant amount of money. And I dedicated myself to trying to get into optometry after one year of undergrad. And um, I studied really hard. I honestly, I went out, I can count the times I went out probably on one hand during, you know, a semester. Uh, so I really sacrificed. Um, I loved my friends in pre-optometry. They helped each other out uh, more so than I would say in professional school, which is unfortunate, but that's another matter we can maybe address in, in questions. Um, and I focused on the interview and I knew it was difficult with uh, a non-full undergrad. You know, now they've made it, I think, impossible at the time. I was probably one, you know, the, the only one in my class who had done that. Um, but uh, I knew I had to succeed in the interview. I knew that um, you know, it was going to be an uphill battle, but I was, uh, I would rather focus in my attention and get in than spend, uh, you know, more years in, in undergrad and just, you know, get into the, the sports analogy, get into the pros, you know, cause you don't know what can happen. You can get injured in the, in college and then your career is done. Same thing in undergrad. I mean, the sooner you get into professional school, the less something can trip you up in, in undergrad. But that having been said, um, now that I'm uh, graduated, <laughs> um, sometimes it's hard to believe I still have nightmares. I'm still in school and I, I've forgotten to do an essay or 
you know, write an exam and I wake up and have to go through it with myself that, oh, no, you've been practicing for almost 20 years. Um, so right now uh, I'm working in Toronto in private practice. Uh, I lecture to optometrists, mostly for continuing education now. I'm doing some lecturing at Waterloo very sporadically uh, uh, because of the pandemic and, you know, uh, obviously things are constantly in flux and I'm not a full-time uh, faculty member, so only as needed. Um, that having, you know, going through all that, now I'm in Yorkville, which is kind of a, a very, uh, let's say, upscale area in Toronto, kind of our Rodeo Drive. So we work in a private practice here. Uh, I work with a group of doctors and um, I find a lot of fun, very rewarding. We have high tech equipment, which I really enjoy working with. And uh, with that having been said, I guess I can go in through some interesting cases and then we'll chat some more. So some of my areas of interest uh, are um, in uh, dry eye and glaucoma. And uh, I won't say any more, we'll go through the case and then we'll uh, chat about it. So um, we're talking about a 68 year old woman who presented for a routine exam. She wasn't taking medications. She didn't really have a history of anything. And I guess um, most people think of optometry as just checking for glasses. The truth is, even though that is still a part of it, that is very little of what I do or what gives me joy. Uh, I, I love giving people a new prescription in the sense of that they can see clearly, but uh, my main focus is on disease uh, and I love doing second opinions and hard to diagnose cases. So um, many people that come in don't know they have a problem and they're just coming in to get uh, their prescription checked. And that's why in this jurisdiction and in most in North America, it's illegal to just do a sight exam where you just check for glasses uh, and you don't look at the health. So uh, the uh, patient's uh, vision coming in was pretty good. It was a little dropped in the right eye. Uh, she had early cataracts, which is normal at this age. And her pressure inside the eye was normal. So if anybody uh, knows a little bit of a glaucoma, they're going to say, oh, well, that eliminates that disease, right? Well, we'll see. Uh, this is what you're looking at is the optic nerve or the, um, the nerve that's at the back of the eye, which transmits the information to the brain. And you can see, if you look at the yellow area in the middle, it's pretty big in comparison to the entirety of the circle uh, or the red area. Now, I like to think of the optic nerve as a donut. So what you're looking at inside the optic nerve, there is the donut hole, if you will the lack of nerves. It's not a perfect explanation, but it works. And then the red area you're seeing is the actual donut itself. So some donuts come out of the oven, right, um, with a bigger hole, a smaller hole. That can be normal. What we don't want is someone nibbling on the donut, right? So changes over time. So that's what we're looking for in that center area. One of the tests that we do, which is pretty cool, is called gonioscopy, which is kind of like a periscope. It's a lens you put on the eye, like a contact lens. And through the different windows of the periscope, you can see the canal that drains the eye. So this is what's being shown here. And there was nothing abnormal uh, in her case. Glaucoma is one word, but it's actually um, relating to multiple diseases. The issue is that when they first discovered it, they didn't know the complexity. So a lot of things that are referred to as glaucoma, it's just because they didn't understand the subtlety of those different diseases. But basically you can have glaucoma for reasons we don't know. I tell patients you can read my 12 page paper or I can tell you simply we don't know. We think it's a degeneration of the optic nerve. Or uh, you can have glaucoma because there's something blocking the canal that drains the fluid. So when we're doing this test, we're just checking, is there something that's actually blocking the canal? Because that would change the way we deal with the disease. Another uh, revolutionary test is ultrasound or pachymetry, which is checking the thickness of the cornea. Before we did this, we used to simply have an understanding that there is a genetic risk. We didn't have genetic testing in the past. And we also knew that there were variations um, based on people's ethnicity uh, or race. And um, we just didn't know why. And one of the factors that differentiates uh, this issue is pachymetry. Uh, because if someone has a thin cornea, and thin corneas are more common in certain populations, they are at higher risk for glaucoma. Uh, and if you have a thicker cornea, it's protective against the disease. So aside from uh, intraocular pressure or the pressure in the eye, this is the most important factor. 
And that was a, a landmark study called the OATS study. So this patient was thin in both eyes. Now, in terms of imaging, this is what really changed the game, uh, I guess now 15 years ago. When I graduated uh, almost 20 years ago, this was in its infancy. And I remember after graduating, one researcher paid me like, I don't know, at the time it seemed like a lot of money, which is probably 20 bucks, uh, to volunteer to scan my nerve. And I knew I had a family history and I knew um, you know, something was evolving and at Waterloo at the research um, facilities, uh, she had tested me on uh, a um, machine like this. Uh, now that researcher is at Bassett Palmer, I believe. But um, this scans the optic nerve. It's called an HRT. And uh, there are multiple technologies, and it's like Blu-ray and all that stuff. You know, one technology wins out. So I love this machine. I think it's lost the war in terms of um, against the competition type scanners, but I still have one, and I want to have one as much as possible for as long as possible. Uh, and you can see it's showing you the donut, the middle, the hole, the red part is the donut hole. And then it's analyzing the rim, which is the actual structure of the donut. Now, what's the RNFL? Well, keeping with the donut analogy, what's the tastiest part of a donut? I don't know about you, but for me, it's the frosting. That's the icing on the cake, literally. So what we're checking here is the RNFL or the extent of the nerve, because if you think about it, you can have a big donut hole. You can have, uh, you know, what appears to be less of a donut, uh, you know, uh, dough around, like the actual structure of the donut. But if there's a lot of frosting, it's still a pretty good donut. So that's to explain that if you have a lot of nerve fiber, well, that's what's important. Because remember, what's the optic nerve doing? It's carrying information to the brain. So if we still have that structure intact, that network, you should be fine. So the other way to think about it is like an electrical wire. If you have a electrical wire, some of them have a lot of, you know, insulation or plastic covering, like, uh, or on your earphones, uh, some, some are thicker, that doesn't really correlate to what's inside carrying the information. It's just the decorative or protective layer. Now, this is the, the big gun, the OCT, uh, which is, which you can think of it like ultrasound, but using uh, light instead of sound. And the light bounces off the different tissues in the eye. This machine is revolutionary because you can see structures at the cellular level. I'm proud to say that in our office, we have a swept source OCT, which is a third generation, and it's uh, very uncommon to have one. It gives a much higher resolution, and um, now I get spoiled. I go to another clinic as well where we have the, this machine that's in the picture, which I love. It's, uh, it's actually my favorite for glaucoma diagnosis, but the images when you're looking at the structures are a little bit grainier. So it's kind of like going back to your iPhone 5 now that you have an iPhone 12. Um, and I, I wrote here about the faster technology that's coming out. Well, it's here and I'm using it and it's pretty cool. So this is a printout of the OCT. Now, um, in the old days, I say that because HRT is being less and less used or, or GDX, which is a different technology, uh, we would compare. And I still like to do that because one error that uh, young optometrists or optometry students make, and for that matter, uh, medical students in every other health field, is that they rely on the technology too much. They worship it as a god. And the thing is, the technology has vulnerabilities, and you need to understand them. Because sometimes you look at a piece of equipment in the optometry or medical, you know, I mean, uh, examination room, and it looks really old school. You know, it's like with a dial, and you're thinking, this is 100 years old. The reality is that uh, when I'm checking pressure, the you know 100-year-old technology is more accurate than a digital kind of screener. So that may be because I'm you know a dinosaur and I and I've lived through kind of the the changes, the transitions in the profession. But maybe it's not so obvious to someone who's 20 years old and has lived with digital devices, you know, from the time they were born. So this actually just looks at the frosting at the top. This is an older. Um, software version of the of what we employ now. Uh, the OCT has evolved from this, but uh, you can see it's showing that she has a drop in the frosting at the top of her donut. You can see the red area in that quadrant. And so that corresponds to the visual field. In optometry, everything is backward. So if she has problems on the top in the nerve fiber layer, it's gonna show a drop in the visual field at the bottom. So this is what you're seeing. At the bottom here, we see all these black squares. 
um, that she cannot see at the bottom of her visual field. Now, can she tell that that's happening? No, she can't because her central vision is unaffected. So she actually can't tell she's lost literally half her vision. And that's the thing about glaucoma, which is that there's no signs and there's no symptoms. So you literally can go blind without realizing it till it's already too late. The central vision is the last part that's affected. Well, the differential diagnosis is a way we explain, we cast a wide net to um, understand what could be the problem. So I'm not gonna read all these off, but basically um, the options are glaucoma, another neurodegenerative process, uh, you know, some uh, growth in the optic nerve, or a primary open angle glaucoma, which is um, the main type of glaucoma, which is about 90% of the cases. Or it could be physiological, which is basically that she was just born that way uh, with a donut, which has a bigger hole in the middle. I don't think that's true because a person like that wouldn't have damage to their optic nerve, nor would they have drops in vision. So I kind of ruined the, uh, I kind of gave you guys the answer, but um, the answer to what she most likely has is primary open angle glaucoma, divided into NTG and HTG. What am I talking about? Well, um, we used to think that there was two different diseases, one where you have high pressure and that's glaucoma, and then where you have low pressure, we still have glaucoma, but we don't know why, and that was called normal tension glaucoma. The truth is that we understand that it's probably, and this is controversial, but it's probably the same disease, it's a spectrum. So some people, just like in life, some people can take a lot of pressure. They're working three jobs. They're working six days a week or seven days a week and they can handle it. Some people, they're working one day a week and they break down. So it's the same thing with glaucoma. Some people have a nerve that can take a lot of pressure and they're still fine. Or some people have a nerve that even at what would be a normal pressure for other people, the nerve is breaking down. So I touched on this, but uh, this patient definitely seemed to have a problem because of the damage to both the nerve and the visual field. She was put on medication, um, which uh, this disease, uh, this um, medication class is the, is the best at the moment. It's a gold standard. You have to put one drop in once a day. I followed up with her and uh, the pressure had stabilized but she was subsequently lost to follow-up, meaning she didn't show up anymore. And this is very common in glaucoma because patients don't know they have a disease. Patients don't want to take drops because sometimes they burn or sting or are inconvenient. And they sometimes maybe don't even trust the diagnosis because it's expensive to get rechecked and get scanned and all this stuff. So they just don't want to do it. And that's the scariest part because in glaucoma, we don't lack the diagnostic skills. We don't lack the technology we don't lack treatments. What we lack is better communication between patient and doctor. And that's, I think, something very important. And most of the second opinions I see um, are not about a patient not being properly diagnosed. It's about a patient not being properly counseled. So in, though, in, in our area, um, our fees are probably one of the highest in the city, if not the highest. We get, you know, uh, Toronto is now a film hub. We get movie stars, celebrities, CEOs, all that stuff. But a lot of patients I see for second opinions are regular people who have been frustrated uh, with the lack of care that they've received and are just willing to spend the money to um, address that issue. And that's a perfect segue into the uh, next case I wanna talk to you about. Uh, I had another one on deck. I don't know if we're gonna get to it, but I'm gonna just, I need to talk to you guys about this one because it's very important. So uh, a while ago in clinic, I had a patient show up and uh, my staff let me know that, you know, she seemed like she wasn't uh, doing very well. She was a little confused. And, you know, you don't know if that's an issue um, that day, if a person is, uh, you know, uh, abusing a substance, if there's something else going on. But it's good to have communication with your uh, staff so you know what's happening, of course, in a discreet and respectful manner to the patient. And um, they, they alerted me as well that the, the um, staff said, you know, we did her scans. And something really doesn't look right. You better take a look at it. So before uh, looking at her, I looked at the scan. It looked like what you're seeing in this photo. The truth is that once I got speaking to her, I can tell you that I could have made the diagnosis from the case history. And this is something you're going to learn if, if uh, no one's mentioned it already, that the most important part of an exam isn't having the high-tech scanners. It's not about all the techniques and the technology. 
It's listening to the patient. If you listen enough, they will tell you the answer. And sometimes with all the technology and all the techniques, if you're not listening to the patient, you'll reach the wrong diagnosis. So looking at this picture, I could already tell that the optic nerve was swollen. If you remember the donut, remember the donut picture I showed you earlier for glaucoma? That's a nerve that's excavated. This nerve is popping out at you. Now I know it's hard to tell, uh, and it's because it's not in 3D, but if you can see, there is no hole in the donut. There is no donut. There's just a mess with uh, the red spots you're seeing as hemorrhaging, burst blood vessels, and the um, donut is actually protruding the opposite way. So it's not excavated, it's actually pointing out at you. So uh, the patient came into my chair and uh, we chatted briefly and she said, doctor, I've been to, you're the ninth doctor I'm seeing and I've been to four hospitals and they keep sending me home, but I have, you know, an, a pounding headache, which, uh, which has not, you know, stopped. And uh, I asked her very delicately, we, you know, I said, you know, I, uh, I need to ask you a few questions. I know they may sound a little strange, but they're related to the condition. I said, have you had some recent weight gain? And she said, yes, um, I had, you know, a substantial amount of weight gain during the pandemic. Um, and she was a young woman, which is also, this is a typical case of increased intracranial pressure. Um, so it's shocking, but not so shocking because I've seen it a lot, but that this woman had to go to four hospitals and I mean, they're much better equipped than me. And, uh, you know, I, I guess another handful of doctors and they sent her home and told her that nothing's wrong. Now, I can tell you that most of the misdiagnoses or these, these types, is not about a lack of knowledge because that can be overcome. And if you have imposter syndrome and you're worried, oh my God, what if I miss something? You're going to be a good doctor. Don't worry. It's the people that aren't worried they're going to miss something that actually do harm. Because if you're not sure, you can always send it. And the, the doctors at the hospital could have sent her to a subspecialist or a neurologist or at least an eye doctor to, to check her. But they didn't. They sent her home. So at this point, this was you know certainly sight-threatening, if not life-threatening. And I couldn't even put her in a, in a cab because uh, she, she didn't have the wherewithal to to deal with it. Um, and uh, so I had to call an ambulance to send her to the hospital. And I wrote a note explaining exactly what was wrong. And, um, you know, it was dealt with. She was at the hospital. The neuro-ophthalmologist who happened to be a, you know, a guy I know well, he messaged me and he said, you know, it's great that you sent her. Uh, I'm sorry she had to go through such a, you know, uh, a, a long road. And, and that's the other thing. You have to trust patients. They know when something's wrong. They know their own body. And when, if you want to believe, and I've seen these kind of cases before where the, the doctors dismiss it as depression or anxiety or all in the patient's head, that is what we call a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out everything. So that is a, a very poor way of dealing with an unknown to assume that it's the patient and it's not you that's missing something. Anyway, the, um, the patient is doing better. Uh, they had actually had to go in, they have to do a lumbar puncture to go in to check the fluid, they had to drain fluid from her uh, cerebrospinal, you know, uh, like the, the column that conducts the, the fluid inside the brain to the, to the spinal uh, column. And um, sometimes they put you on medication, sometimes um, they have to do that, which is pretty radical, but it was a, an urgent case. And then uh, you, you know, exercise and weight loss is, uh, and diet, uh, you know, control is a, a long-term solution. Um, so, I think I'd rather address questions before I, I, I delve into um, the next case, unless, um, what do you think? Do you, do you want me to, to go through one more case quick and then take questions, or do you want me to, to stop and take the questions? Whichever one works with you. We have just one question so far, so, okay, so maybe we'll take we that and then keep yeah. the questions rolling in and then save them yeah, for exactly. the Q&A, but up to you. Yeah, so I'll keep rolling then. I know I'm a very intimidating guy. It must be... Uh, I'm joking, I don't know if you can see it. I'm like one of the skinniest uh, people around. Um, so we'll get into one more case uh, and I'll even talk to you about it. If, if questions aren't rolling in, I can talk to you about my other passion, which is dry eye. But um, this is a different case. A 30 year old female presented to the office with a painful eye, uh, which was red and swollen. Uh, she had slept in her contacts the, um, you know, the previous night. She was using disposables. Uh, her vision was normal in both eyes, and 
So this is to make a point, which is that you can have normal vision and have a very serious condition. Uh, and I'll spare you the technicals, but but in the um, what we saw in the slow lamp, which is the microscope we used at the eye doctors, there was a um, excavation in her cornea, which is the front surface. And that is typical of a certain condition. And I'll try not to ruin as much as I did in the other case. So you can see the excavation here is the white part. Now, the eye is transparent because a beautiful arrangement of the cells in the cornea, which allows the, the eye to see because light can pass through. Now, when there's a disruption of that, the eye is no longer clear. And so the tissue gets what we call organized or scarred. And what you're seeing here is the pus from uh, an infection. And even when it's resolved, it'll no longer be clear. So the patient, if it was central, would lose vision or go blind and would need a corneal transplant if they want to see again. So what do you think it is? I'll give you a moment if there's uh, some geniuses on the call who want to uh, you know, tell us what they think the condition is. And um, I, I'll go through the diagnosis of uh, the differentials unless anybody had, did anybody uh, give a guess? This is, a, I mean, this isn't necessarily the condition. I'm just going through the differential. Did anybody guess or it's a tough one. I, I'm not, I don't blame anybody for not guessing. Half, half my, you know, students in a class may not, wouldn't be sure. So um, bacterial keratitis is a condition where a patient sleeps in their contacts overnight and they get a contact lens related infection where for many reasons, and again, I love these mysterious diseases, we used to think that um, if you had enough oxygen in the lens, this couldn't happen. The oxygen deprivation would create a crack in the surface, and then the bacteria would flow in, which otherwise was not possible. We now understand that it's much more complex than that, because even though we have contact lenses that allow physiological levels of oxygen, which means enough oxygen uh, to mimic a normal condition, on the surface as if the contact lens wasn't there, we're still getting corneal ulcers. So why is that? Well, the body's much smarter than we think. And essentially, when the eyes close, we believe that the immune system drops because the eye's thinking, well, there shouldn't be anything in here, we shut the door. But if there's a Trojan horse, which you've introduced, like that contact lens, well, then the bacteria which are on that lens come out of a base or what's known as a biofilm, a hardened bunker inside the base, and they can wreak havoc. So that is one of the ways we believe, although it's not you know, uh, certain, that uh, that's the way it goes. And this is something which may be shocking to a lot of students. Um, you know, you think, I don't know, on the TV show, sometimes they know exactly what it is. And you, know, you see scientists tell you all, these, all this information and your professor seems so smart. The truth is a lot of conditions, we have no idea why it's happening, or we're definitely not sure. And a lot of it's theory uh, and we stumble upon explanations that work. Um, now, fungal keratitis isn't as common uh, in North America, but um, it's more common in, in other parts of the world uh, where contact lens use isn't necessarily as common and um, injury is more common, particularly with vegetable matter. Uh, so uh, it's differentiated by feathery borders and other things. Also, again, a very painful condition. I've only seen it once in my career, and it can cause blindness as well. Acanthamoeba is very nasty, and it's a uh, condition where you swim or shower in your contacts or swim in a lake in your contacts. And not only can you go blind, just like the um, one where you sleep in your contacts, but it's extremely painful, difficult to diagnose. And at first, you don't see many signs, so it can be uh, missed, and the patient can actually uh, you know, go blind um, because of a lack of a diagnosis. And unfortunately, even if you diagnose it, there's very few effective treatments. So it's pretty nasty. Here's a picture of it. Again, it can look like um, a corneal ulcer uh, related to contacts. And that's why sometimes, even though uh, in school, they can show you very stark contrast between things. When you get to the real world, nothing really looks like a textbook. So you have to and it doesn't fit into perfect categories necessarily. So you really have to do some thinking and digging and cover your bases in case it's not what you initially thought. So uh, not to get too professorial, but we call it a closed loop where you're gonna check with the patient again to make sure that uh, things are working as you expected. Herpes simplex, um, 
is another condition that can be, um, when I tell patients that they have herpes in the eye, they get very depressed and start crying and think that it's an STI. Um, what's ironic is that I reassure them and tell them it's not necessarily sexually transmitted, but in the eye, it can be blinding. And, you know, in the genital area or on the lips, it doesn't really do a whole lot compared to that kind of devastating effect. So they're very relieved and they're like, oh, okay, it's not, not sexually transmitted, but, uh, but I'm like, you know, but you can't lose vision. You got to do the treatment. They're like, oh, okay, that's all right. That's all right. So it's, uh, it's interesting the stigma we attach to certain diseases. Uh, herpes simplex, again, you know, it's, it's generally acquired uh, in youth. Uh, in fact, most people, when they reach their 40s, are carriers of it, so there's not much point in testing. Um, but in uh, a certain subset of those people who carry the virus, they express it through, um, you know, lesions, whether it's on the lips, mouth, or eyes, or inside the eye. Herpes zoster is um, not to be confused with simplex, although it's the same family, it's a totally different uh, condition. It's what happens after you get chickenpox, the virus stays in your dorsal root ganglion in the, uh, you know, inside your body. And later on in life, when you're stressed, your immune system is down, it takes advantage of it, comes out and starts attacking, uh, you know, one side of your body in a different area, whether it's, you know, on your torso, on your face, uh, and there can be ocular involvement. And um, sometimes the first signs are in the eye. So you want to treat, not only treat the eye, but of course, you have to treat the patient very rapidly because if you don't, they can have uh, lifelong pain, uh, which, you know, it's actually a common cause of suicide for patients who have post herpetic neuralgia or the pain associated with that condition, which can be long lasting. Um, there you can see the, the differentiation. We don't have to worry about too much. It's getting to details, but herpes simplex and zoster look similar, but there's ways to tell between the two. Lastly, marginal keratitis is related to, um, sometimes related to dry eye conditions, um, rosacea and other skin conditions that can cause little ulcerations in the uh, cornea, but those are not contact lens related and those generally don't cause blindness, although they can, but they're generally treated in a different way uh, with a steroid combination where in a ulcer from a bacteria or, or from, a, from a true corneal ulcer uh, related to contacts or otherwise can be um, uh, devastating if you put a steroid on there because it can lower, remember steroids lower the body's defenses uh, or the inflammatory reaction. So it would give the pathogen free reign to attack. And here is, it is, and it's, uh, it has a telltale kind of typical uh, sign, but we don't have to get into the technical details of what that is. So the patient was diagnosed with CLMK or contact lens related microbial keratitis. Uh, I treated her one drop to control the uh, inflammation and then uh, antibiotics every hour, which is essentially off label or not what the antibiotic is uh, indicated for, but that's what we use to do it. And the um, pharmacist will think you're insane because that antibiotic is usually three times a day, and I'm you know, prescribing it. Uh, the entire day, sometimes even more than that. Um, I followed up with her and generally, to, to make a long story short, the uh, ulcer closed uh, slowly but surely and um, the patient was counseled um, also about the risks of sleeping in the contact lenses. And that's one of the dangers of online purchase and people purchasing without a prescription and kids thinking it's a uh, cosmetic device rather than a medical device because they end up going to an overnight party, sleeping in the lens, if they have colored contacts, you know, they don't want their friends to see their real colored eyes. And all that can lead to very devastating consequences. Again, that's how important the patient education is that it supersedes almost everything else because you can avoid this entire situation. So this condition affects, uh, you know, uh, luckily not that many people. So I explain to people just like running a red light you can survive and not know anything happened and think, oh, it's okay to sleep in my contacts. But that's not the case. And I think with that, hopefully we've uh, amassed some more questions or I can spur some uh, discussion. And I'll uh, invite you guys to uh, add me to uh, Instagram. I post about all, the, all these kind of things and uh, study tips and more. Definitely, we have a few questions here. So. The first of which is, how would you be able to measure the sensitivity of an optic nerve? And is this going to be through a machine or a set of tests that you would conduct? What would you go 
uh, how would you go about that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think when you mean sensitivity, you mean um, like how well it's functioning. So there's many tests you can use. So I had a patient uh, the other day, I use all my high tech tests, but believe it or not, sometimes I don't even trust the scanner because it can be all kinds of things or the scanner, the scan could be off. So again, you can't rely on that stuff. So what I use is a test called the red cap test. And I don't want to give uh, Coca-Cola, you know, too much free publicity here, but um, it's by looking at the cap of a drop that I use in the office. And I said, if you close one eye, does the cap look as bright in either eye? And the cap didn't look as bright in, in the eye that was affected. Uh, there's color vision defects that sometimes happen. Um, and you know, you can just by checking the pupil, those very simple tests, sometimes you can get a response there and see that the, the pupil response isn't as brisk in the affected eye. So enough to say that you don't need the high tech stuff to be a good doctor. But in this case, I had the luxury of the scanners and uh, it was clear on, on the scan that uh, there was damage. Uh, so again, the patient came in thinking they had a glaucoma issue and they came to me because of my interest in glaucoma, but it turned out to be a totally different situation. Uh, so all the glaucoma stuff was a red herring. So again, it's very uh, important, even though you're, you may focus on a certain disease, not to be a hammer that sees nails everywhere, to look beyond your particular area of expertise. The second question we have is, would cataracts also cause glaucoma by forming granules which build up in the drainage channels? That's a very good question. So uh, cataracts don't cause glaucoma in the conventional sense. I can get super nerdy and tell you that if a patient's eye is small, the growth of the cataract can obstruct that canal that uh, drains the fluid. And that can be a different kind of glaucoma called angle closure glaucoma. So Again, the word glaucoma shouldn't be used for both things, but because we didn't know the difference, we thought everything that creates pressure is glaucoma. So that's why the, the disease is called glaucoma as well. Then there's secondary glaucomas, which are caused by stuff clogging, as you would suggest, the canal. Um, so there is sloughing of material in a certain condition. I'm not gonna bore everyone too much with very technical stuff, but pseudoexfoliation, um, which looks like the material on the lens is sloughing off and going into the canal, although it's more complicated than that. It's a, it's a systemic disease where these, uh, these uh, granules are produced. And there's pigment dispersion glaucoma where stuff is coming off the iris, the colored part of the eye and clogging the canal. So you're on the right track. You're actually correct in a lot of ways, but it's just a little more complicated as is always the case, unfortunately, in life. Thank you for answering that. Also, uh, for the second case, you mentioned if one of the hospital, hospitals were to order an MRI, would the swelling of the optic nerve be able to be visualized? That's an excellent question. Uh, so uh, this kind of touches in on something else, which I, which I like to talk about, uh, multiple sclerosis. So a lot of patients will come in and they're having um, you know, symptoms which can be of MS. Unfortunately, in the old days without MRIs, they would look into the back of the eye and the optic nerve would look normal. And they would say the person is probably, you know, making it up or they're, you know, have a mental health issue, which was totally wrong. What they couldn't see is that the optic nerve, what you see in the eye is just my fist. You don't see the length of my hairy arm, which is the nerve. Um, and so if there's swelling here, the, my fist or the optic nerve, which is visible inside the eye won't show anything. And it's on the MRI that you'll see the lesion. Uh, or the demyelinating lesion, which is that there's interruption of the circuitry uh, or swelling from a different cause. So uh, the MRI will show certain types of optic nerve damage. In terms of glaucoma, honestly, that would be an incredibly expensive way to look for it. And I don't believe you could see it or you'd need a very, very uh, specific and sophisticated uh, type of machine. In fact, the OCT is way more precise than an, than an MRI when you're dealing with glaucoma and far less expensive. So going back to the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the you know, differences between optometry, ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. For you, what, did, what, what kind of pushed you over to um, the side of optometry um, and pursuing that rather than ophthalmology? I, I wasn't aware of the differences in, in remuneration. Um, I'm just kidding. The, the reason why I, I did it was because uh, for me at the time, I didn't want to go through, uh, you know, other like med school where you see a lot of rotations of different types of um, healthcare professions, different, because for me, I knew I wanted to work with the eye. I wasn't 
um, you know, enthralled with the, with the thought of surgery. And that's really what basically differentiates optometry and ophthalmology that in ophthalmology in North America, at least, I know in other parts of the world, it's different. But in North America, optometrists are like the family doctor of the eye. Although you can have uh, areas of interest, that depending on the jurisdiction, you're not allowed to call it a specialty. So that's why I'm just careful with the wording. But, uh, but they're optometrists who focus on one area alone. Um, but in most jurisdictions, again, optometrists don't do surgery. There are some jurisdictions now where they do. But that's really generally the differentiating factor between optometrists optometry and ophthalmology, and ophthalmology is much longer because you go through medical school and then you specialize in the eye after, so you're looking at you know, 12 years of school. Uh, optometry is uh, eight years, you know, with your undergrad, so that's, um, you know, a, a, a much, much shorter track, and I was getting to do what I wanted to do. Now, had I known that, uh, I'm just kidding, but I mean, it, there is a real big difference in what, in the type of salary and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that kind of structure is very different. Next question we have is, is dry eye syndrome primarily caused by blocked ducts or is there a genetic or neural component? That's a great question. So um, I will say, and not that I think you, your, your train of thought is fantastic, but um, it's actually, we believe it's kind of neither. Uh, we believe it's uh, at the core an autoimmune disease, but you're not wrong or the body attacking itself, I should say for you know, uh, just to, to explain to the entire audience um, that it's the body attacking itself um, and misinterpreting uh, the tissue as being an enemy. So the body's destroying itself. And the complication to that is that while the body is busy attacking itself, uh, there's other kind of actors that take advantage of it, which are bacteria and mites, which can complicate things because the body isn't fending them off. They, it's, you know, destroying itself. So it's like a civil war, if you will, and there's, you know, then you can have other issues like crime or gangs or this kind of thing that, that um, can flourish in that kind of environment. Um, now, the blocked ducts is a major part, so you're not wrong. Blocked ducts uh, are part of my bone gland dysfunction, which is a major part of dry eye. And then there is also flaking on the lashes, which is a product of all, everything I, I discussed. But there are conditions in which dry eye is simply a lack of tears, which is what we used to believe. But we now understand that's a very small minority, and that's from usually from complications from diseases like lupus uh, or rheumatoid arthritis, and they get a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, which uh, decreases the aqueous production or the, or the fluid of tears. Uh, that's on the eye. To go along with that question, they also asked, does prolonged use of OTC eye drops make dry eye syndrome worse? No, it doesn't actually. That's a good, really good question. So um, I think Amazon was at my door. Hopefully they're going to leave the packages, but uh, I got that, that, that big knock, but they usually just leave it there. Um, so uh, the, the use of drops is not something that you get addicted to, but you want a high quality drop. Although I will say that the treatment of dry eye is not drops. And that's the thing that what you need to do is you need to treat the underlying inflammatory condition. And we have everything from warm compresses and lid scrubs, which is the mainstay. And I used to, when I lectured about it 10 years ago, I, I like saying that no one was taking it seriously because uh, you know, it wasn't fully understood and there wasn't much money in it. Now that dry eye treatments are in the thousands with technology like IPL and RF, uh, intense pulse light and radio frequency, everyone, everybody wants in. Uh, they, find, they, they all of a sudden start caring about dry eye. So um, you know, that's my, my, my cynical point, but it's, it's to say that uh, you also want to go to somebody who understands what they're treating because it's not a one size fits all. The same doctors that were just giving everyone drops because they didn't want to deal with it now are giving everybody uh, a one size fits all treatment uh, because it's, you know, several thousand dollars, but that's not how dry works. You need to create a tailored approach to each case, but it's very rare that drops themselves are the only thing recommended. Another question we have is about glaucoma. So glaucoma is in a basic way caused by pressure on the optical nerve and can lack and can cause a lack of blood flow towards the optic nerve. Um, would that be the cause of it? The blood flow? Yeah, they say, but can a lack of blood flow towards the optic nerve also cause it? Yeah, so, so that's the million dollar question because we're not sure what happens first it's, if it's a blood flow issue or a nerve issue. And so the newer OCTs, like the one I have in the office, has something 
called OCTA, where you uh, basically get an analysis of the blood flow to the optic nerve and to the central area of vision. And we're still not sure. I mean, researchers aren't sure what happens first, but we do believe there are microvascular issues, yes. Um, so whether that happens first, the microvascular changes or the uh, loss of uh, you know, the, the, the optic nerve tissue is a question which still needs resolution. Um, regarding the opportunities, sorry, were you going to? No, like I said, you guys are asking incredible questions. Excellent. Question. Oh. So regarding the opportunities uh, for further education, um, past just general optometry school, what are the opportunities available? For example, fellowships. Um, obviously, that's something in the U.S. that we have, but in Canada, what's the case? Are there fellowships? Other opportunities like that? Right. Oh, I didn't know you guys were uh, doing this from Canada, so that's uh, that's cool, um, or at least some of you. So there. The, as you can see on my, I, mean, I guess if you read my credentials, it's the Fellowship of the American Academy of Optometry and Diplomate of the American Board. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why didn't you do in Canada? There is no Canadian equivalent. Uh, and so those are um, qualifications which you can get. Honestly, in terms of practice, it doesn't matter. There's, in, especially in Canada, there's very, I mean, most doctors won't know what that is. So it's more if you want to go into an academic setting or, or lecture. And then in the U.S., about I think 10% are fellows, and and uh, a smaller amount are you know diplomates as well. But what you 